Right. Um, fantastic. Uh, 600 seconds. Right. Um, do, do those lights go out or do they... Does that... They're on or off. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, if it goes off, that'd be brilliant. But if it electrocutes you, don't worry. Um, <laughs> fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Every nation has its own origin myths, has its own sort of foundation story. Um, and it wasn't fairly long ago, it's everywhere, every single political leader had their own origin myth, had their own sort of way of proving why they should lead. So we have Augustus, first emperor of Rome, who claimed to be descended from Romulus, founder of the city, to Aeneas, uh, progenitor of the Roman race, and back to Venus. So we've got sort of divine blood coursing through his family. We've got William the Bastard, uh, first Norman king of Britain, first Norman king of England. Uh, like all the Christians of the time could claim descent from Adam and Eve, but his own genealogy, of course, goes back through Old Testament prophets like Abraham and other significant leaders. And when we're looking at politicians and kings, monarchs and queens and so on, we can understand why those particular origin myths have been created to try and instate them in power. When we're talking about nation states, it becomes far more difficult because we've lost the context of why those stories were important. Uh, we've lost sort of the, the audience for which they are being designed. Now, as far as Britain goes, I suspect quite a few of them origin myths have been lost, but some have been preserved in early medieval texts. So we have things like Gildas, uh, who is by no means uh, an objective historian, but is writing a, a particularly uh, sort of uh, ranting polemic against the politicians and the religious leaders of his own time and describes the, the first Anglo-Saxons as a scourge from God coming down to punish the Britons for their sinful ways. We have Bede, uh, writing in the early 8th century from a very different perspective that the <coughs> Saxons are arriving because they're God's chosen people and they're arriving in the, the promised land of Britain. We've got the Gestalt entity Nennius, uh, who is, or whoever they, they were, compiling lots of different data sets, plays, poems, genealogies um, and other sort of texts together, which is a real sort of hodgepodge of material, but there's lots of good origin myths in there. And of course, we've got the one, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle compiled in the late 9th century, which is really a way of defining English ethnicity and the early Saxon kingdoms in the face of onslaught uh, from Norse settlers. So we've got a whole variety of different origin myths. I won't go through them all, but there are some entertaining ones. Uh, there are communities on the east coast of Scotland uh, in the 9th century claiming descent from the Scythians. We've got... Uh, communities on the western coast claiming descent from the Egyptians. We've got the Israelites settling in eastern Ireland. We've got the Trojans in southwestern Britain. And we've got the Saxons in the east. And the Trojan story, of course, is one that has a very sort of deep origin in time. We've got uh, the Roman state claiming descent from uh, Aeneas and his followers and his immediate family. So uh, sort of travelling around the Mediterranean, finding footfall in central Italy. We've got the whole sort of Roman imperial machine defining itself as not being Greek, not being Italian, but certainly as a sort of a, a glorious defeated um, warrior race from deep time. And that sense of Trojan heritage we can also see coming out in a whole variety of Iron Age tribal origin myths in central France and indeed within Britain. We can see it being picked <coughs> up by the Plantagenet monarchs, we can see it by the sort of the Normans, and also the Tudor dynasty tap into that sense of an heroic warrior ancestry for them to legitimise their control on power. But it's not till the 17th century did that whole sense of a Trojan inheritance become uh, sort of ridiculed and dismissed and eventually forgotten. The Saxon, the sort of the English uh, background, something um, which in the Anglo-Saxon chronicles we can also say is to some degree fantastical. We've got individuals, this is really sort of creating a sense of how the first kingdoms came about, so it's their origin myths. We've got a whole series of individuals coming across the, the North Sea, um, settling with small shiploads of, of uh, people against great adversity, establishing a kingdom um, and going on to great things. So Port arrives with two ships at Portsmouth. Uh, Kerdick and Kinrick arrive in Wessex with five ships. 
And of course, the big thing, as many people have noticed there, of course, Kurdic and Kimlik, they're British names, they're not Germanic, they're not Saxon, so we've probably got uh, remembered British kings who have become Germanized and created uh, as part of this to, to create a legitimacy for the Wessex kingdoms. We've got Hengist and Horsa arriving in Kent in three ships in 449, according to the Chronicle. Um, there they are, lovely chaps. Um, and the sense there, that, as again, as people have noticed, is their names Stallion and in some variant uh, interpretations, Mare, which is uh, a strange name for a brother to have. But these two brothers, as far as we can see, entirely fictional, maybe relating to uh, a Germanic set of deities, horse deities, maybe relating to Castor and Pollux, the sort of uh, the Mediterranean variants of horse deities, but it's quite clear they're not real. But what we've got are two competing narratives, essentially. The Britons, Geoffrey and Monmouth, Nennius, establishing this Trojan origin. We've got Bede and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle fighting for this Germanic English origin. We've got Geoffrey and Monmouth and a sense of this is where Brutus the Trojan first set foot in Totnes, of all places. But the sense that the the origin story of the Trojans is easily dismissed because it's got giants, it's got dragons, it's got magic, it's got a whole range of mythological, fantastical elements in it. All the sorts of things that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle doesn't have, even though it's quite clear that a lot of those origin stories are just as fantastical. The danger with these origin myths is, of course, they emphasise this sense of purity and bloodline and um, a whole sense of other sort of Aryan attributes which have already been used in the mid 20th century uh, to re extremely negative effects. But you can see that kind of corrosive sense, the way in which archaeology has been misused to give this idea of migration and uh, sort of the Germanic Aryan and certainly English settlers. And we can see that coming out today, certainly, this sense of defining Englishness using terms like shield wall, um, using other sort of uh, Germanic Saxon terms, uh, sort of turning the uh, flag of St George into a swash sticker. And of course, archaeology is doing something to counter that. We can see the sort of sense, the, the debate in recent months about the term Anglo-Saxon, because in archaeology, it's a relatively neutral and benign term. We understand it with regards to material culture. The rest of the world see it in slightly different terms. Uh, we can see it as colonialism, um, in the sense of uh, white supremacy, elitism, all the sort of overtly negative terms. So that, in a sense, is good in that the, the, the term is being discussed and being debated uh, and being reconsidered. There are other things we can do. We can reject things um, this is a particularly obscure but one would think, 1905, Our Island Story. Uh, it's one that came into the headlines quite recently because it was David Cameron's favourite book. Uh, again, you mentioned before, um, I'm sure you remember he used to be a Prime Minister. Uh, when I was younger, I particularly enjoyed Our Island Story by Henrietta Marshall. It is written in a way that captured my imagination, which nurtured my interest in the history of our great nation. It is... I, it is a very difficult book. I prefer to think of it as Mein Kampf for England, because in a sense, it is, we've got the, the Britain, primitive Britons being civilised by the Romans, then the Saxons arrive and they bring uh, a purity to the bloodline, then there's internal conflicts, and then everything that Britain represents, sorry, England represents, because Scotland, Wales, uh, are largely written out of that story, is then exported out into the world. It's, it's a difficult, it, it's, it is, it's overtly racist in several points, especially when it's talking about British Empire. I, I really dislike it. But it is a book that Kibitas, the, the right-wing think tank, felt every school should have. And it went through a system of raising money for it. Uh, again, there was a big chapter like the Saxons coming to Britain, the strongest and bravest men, Hengist and Horsa, so-called because they were strong and brave. Uh, and with Kibitas... Um, raising money thanks to the Daily Telegraph to try and get uh, uh, copies within every school to promote that story. I understand the significance of getting history across, but this is a very difficult book written at a, a very long time ago, and I would argue it's not one that our schools should see. But it's one in which politicians do like. I'm not going to embarrass any politicians who have said that they uh, praise and support this book. But it is one that, at this particular time, is gaining a, a lot of significance. I would argue that when we're talking about the uh, <coughs> Saxon 
migration as one of many. We, we know that there are migra there are thousands and thousands of migrations across Europe and into Britain, each one bringing different ideas and cultures and religions <coughs> and languages and so on. We should be considering those. We shouldn't be focusing on one particular event uh, because contrary to what the, the venomous speed said, there's no such thing as God's chosen people. Thank you.